Hello there, my name is Brandon, and in this video series, I'm going to show you how I created this isometric pixel art scene within Clip Studio Paint. Over the entire series, we'll build up a room and fill it with details, and then finish the entire thing with some animation. In this first video, we're going to discuss how to set up a custom isometric grid, and then we'll use that to create the main foundation for the room scene. Isometric pixel art is most commonly built along lines composed of two pixel wide segments. These angles create the horizontal plane, while a straight line upward creates the vertical. You can create isometric art at other configurations, such as using one pixel or three pixel segments, and those will yield steeper or shallower viewing angles respectively. For the illustration in this series, we're gonna use the common two pixel format. And to get started, I'm creating my own custom pixelated grid so that I'm able to build out and keep track of everything in this view. I'm using the dot pen to create a line that's composed of five two pixel segments along each side. And then I mirror this line to generate a full unit cell. This is then copy pasted out and shifted into place as repeating units until they fill the entire document. And these will be the isometric grid lines upon which the illustration can be drawn. For my work, I'm using a document size of 180 by 180 pixels. And to assist my view of the grid lines, I typically fill them with a bright color like a pink and reduce the opacity to about 20%. Now what we want to do is flip over to the line tool and make sure that the anti-aliasing is set to the option labeled as none, which is going to give us our crisp pixelated edges. With the brush size set to one pixel, we can drag out a line over top of our grid for guidance to generate one that follows that angle. But do you notice how this line has a few stray pixels running through it that also don't really settle into place? It's not really a series of clean two pixel segments, we're getting a bit more connectivity between the pixels than we desire. Well, if you're encountering this, it's usually kind of hit or miss depending upon where you click to start the line. But my trick here is that you can actually avoid this altogether by changing the brush size to something slightly less than one pixel, uh, like 0.9 pixels, which kind of sounds counterintuitive at first, but now when we attempt to drag out that same line, we're not seeing those excessive connections. My guess is that these artifacts result from how the pixel angles are interpolated, and by lowering the brush size, we're able to avoid just enough of that artifacting through the angle to leave us with a clean pixel perfect line. So using this technique, I'm roughing out a large rectangle by following those grid lines around at a sizing that I think looks about right for creating my room. This rectangle is going to be the floor of the room, and so I'm going to turn it into a bit of a thicker platform by copy pasting that rectangle out, and then moving it down and kind of erasing the excess that shouldn't be showing through. I always like the look of having another layer of platform underneath, so I copy this piece again and bring the sides in a little bit to make it distinct. Now this doubled up look feels a little bit more sturdy and interesting for the room construction. The walls are built in a similar manner, except I'm starting by drawing a vertical line for their height and then following the grid line along until it meets the other side to bring it back down. One of the things that's nice about isometric construction is that once you get a few of the walls and floors built, you can always just copy paste and mirror those pieces to quickly generate other sides. Or if you keep designing with the grid, uh, that's at least providing that point of reference for where things should intersect. When needing to make adjustments to the architecture or the sizing, one option is to use something like the rectangle selection tool to drag over certain pieces and bump them around with your arrow keys, uh, just like I'm doing here to shrink the floor plan a little bit. But another great option is to use the polyline selection tool, as this lets you drop down a series of points to define a selection area. So it's really useful for targeting kind of a specific line or an angle that you want to adjust. Um, so with this section here, I had been making all these kind of adjustments because I thought it'd be cool to work in a small upper level platform above the room. And I guess as we've seen from the final illustration already, this eventually ends up being this elevated garden area within the room. Uh, my plan with this room design is it's sort of like a personal quarters on board a spaceship uh, or a space station or something to that effect. And at this phase, I was just kind of improvising some architecture to eventually decorate with that theme. For a lot of these internal pieces, I'm generally building my line work somewhere along the grid, but then once it takes shape, I'll shift those pieces into place within the design. For this reason, it's important to design new pieces on their own layers so that you have that kind of individual control over it without affecting the existing design. And then once it's in a good spot, I'll just stop and merge it with the rest. And I've just been using line work until now because I find it to be the easiest way to keep track of how everything fits together. But our next step is going to be to add a simple shading scheme to provide some dimensionality. To color this entire piece, I'm going to use this predefined color palette here called Retro 24. Now this is a set of 24 colors that I've put together myself that's inspired by the vibrant look of retro games. 
And I published this color set on the Clip Studio Assets page. So if you'd like to download it for yourself, you can check it out there. Now, the thing is, although I like these colors, um, I'm the one that selected them after all, uh, the contrast is actually quite strong within this palette. And I want to obtain a bit of a softer appearance when shading the faces of the walls and floors of my room. So I'm going to use a function called intermediate color. And you can see when we click on this, we get a new window which has a color in each corner. And then between those, there's sort of this array of discrete color steps that are connecting those colors together. The way this works is that you can drop a unique color into each of the four corners, and you'll end up with all these in-between options to sample from. And it's kind of like a painter mixing paints, uh, but in a more digital sense, I guess. So here, by mixing this uh, pink and blue with the black and white, we get this variety of purples in addition to the main tones uh, that we can work with. And they're all derived from that relationship between those original four colors. These are, of course, just to show a really clear example of the intermediate palette at work. But what I'm actually going to do for this piece is use a combination of light grays and blues to generate these more subtle and neutral options to select from. With my lightest shade selected, I'm going to use the fill tool to drop that color inside sections of my line work. And it's important to ensure that the apply to connected pixels only box is checked. That way it only fills within that contained space. In shading this artwork, I'm using the lightest tone on all the walls that are facing from the left side. I'm using kind of a middle tone on all the floors and things that are, you know, facing upward. And then I'm using the darkest tone on the walls that are facing that other direction. The walls of the additional platform underneath are shaded one step darker just to distinguish them from the main platform and to kind of cast them in a bit of shadow too. Now here's where it gets a bit more interesting because we can now play with the appearance of the line work to change how the overall presentation looks here. Rather than sticking with pure black line work, I'm going to go through and swap out some of these with different colors. Again, following some kind of consistent logic or hierarchy too. Another thing that's fun with isometric artwork is you could also just entirely remove the line work. Um, or you could do this sort of half step approach where we'll actually erase every other pixel of the line to generate a dash line that still holds that same original angle. I kind of like this one just because it still works to section things off, but it's not as heavy as having the full line there. So just like with the walls and floors, one of the keys to augmenting line work like this is to try and use those same stylistic choices in every equivalent situation. So like every edge that's facing that same way, I'll do in the same color or same kind of pattern. And that way you maintain a consistent read across the entire piece. A lot of pixel art rendering actually is sort of about defining these rules for yourself and kind of using them to guide your decisions throughout an illustration. After getting all that line work changed out, you can see the effect that it has on the overall presentation here. We're kind of getting a softer appearance compared to the more bold look of the original dark line work. This is the kind of rendering decision that's of course entirely up to your own preference, um, but it's definitely worth experimenting with dark line work, with colored line work, uh, or with no lines at all, and you can see these very different options for how your scene can look. From here, I'm just going to give a small amount of styling to the empty room, uh, which will be kind of a preview for a lot of the stuff that will be happening in the next video. Um, but I'm going to start here with the floor tile design, and this one's built quite simply using the original grid lines. Building the isometric room the way we have has also left us with a lot of plain or flat shapes. And a good way to make those a little bit more interesting is to break up their silhouette with angles or pieces that kind of jut out to create additional framing. For a lot of this base design, I'm using those colors that were generated during the shading and rendering phase to kind of make these changes to the architecture. And these colors are also getting repurposed to create a few basic objects as well. All right, well, that'll do it for part one. Uh, this is the foundation of our scene. And in the next video, we're gonna fill the room by building out some objects and characters. So thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.